Gospel according to John is found in the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have etern <coughs> eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen in their deeds what have, what, that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. What comes to your mind when you hear this verse? What memories does it evoke in you? For me, it's music. I remember one of my favorite choir anthems, God So Loved the World, from John Stainer's Oratorio of the Crucifixion. I sang it for the first time as a teenager and could probably sing it from memory at this point. The music presents the King James translation, which is probably how the verse is most familiar to some of us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is, without a doubt, one of the most familiar, most quoted, most memorized, and most beloved verses in Scripture. It has also become a part of our culture outside the church. Just like last week's Ten Commandments, you can find this verse everywhere. Even non-Christians recognize the citation. The verse appears on plaques and pins and bookmarks and paperweights, even tattoos and creative haircuts. Some of you may remember that many years ago there was a man who managed to be at one of the televised football games each week, there, and there weren't many games on TV back then. He would sit in the end zone wearing a rainbow-striped Afro wig and holding a sign that read simply, John 3.16. Around that same time, at least in Southern California, there was a popular bumper sticker that read, God so loved the world. You know the rest. But just what is our passion for this verse? I think it's that it speaks so clearly of God's love. But just what is love? Do we really know what that word means? I mean, love in our culture today is a confusing word with many meanings, and we toss it about so freely. I love what you've done with your hair. Oh, I love the mountains this time of year. I love my new house. And love is certainly more complicated than what we see in movies and television, or what we read about in most novels. This is not God's love. Popular Christian writer Max Lucado shares a beautiful story he heard from a friend who had just returned from a family trip to Disney World. The family was in Cinderella's castle. It was packed with kids and their parents, when suddenly all the children rushed towards one place because Cinderella had entered the room. She was perfectly typecast, a gorgeous young girl with a beaming smile. She stood waist deep in this garden of children, each wanting to touch and be touched. On the other side of the room, however, was a young boy holding the hand of what was probably an older brother. The boy was about seven or eight years old. Frankly, his, hard, his age was hard to determine because his body and his face were terribly disfigured. He just stood there watching quietly. He wanted to be with the children, to be in the middle of the kids, reaching for Cinderella, but he was afraid of being rejected, afraid of being taunted, 
afraid of the look of revulsion that might appear on Cinderella's face when she saw his scars. Well, the princess noticed the little boy and immediately began to move in his direction. Politely but firmly, inching through the crowd of children, she finally broke free, walked, walked quickly across the room, knelt at eye level with the stunned little boy, and placed a kiss on his face. His smile was transformative. This one action changed his entire appearance. And this is like God's love. God's loved love comes to us through Christ and gives us the gift of transformation, the gift that can only come from God. Through the love of God, we are transformed into a new creation. Now, this would be a really good thought to end the sermon, but there is more. You see, that favorite choir anthem that I mentioned at the beginning doesn't stop with verse 16. It goes on to verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to contend, condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's important that we remember this verse, too, because God became flesh not to condemn the world, but to experience life with us. If we stop reading at verse 16, we run the risk of turning those beautiful words into words of judgment. We are left to assume that those who do not believe in the Son do not receive eternal life. And I know there are a lot of judgment words that follow there in our reading, but Jesus is not our judge. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus does not look at our sin and say, oh, sorry, your sin is too great. Off you go to hell. No, Jesus looks at our sin and sees nothing. Jesus came to heal the world from sin and brokenness. God understands human nature and knows that punishment never heals. Only love can heal. The threat of punishment can change behavior because of fear, but God's love changes behavior because it can heal us from the pain that causes our sinful behavior. And this amazing love of God comes before we change our behavior. Look at the second lesson, the reading from Ephesians. We were dead because of our sin, but God, so rich in mercy and filled with love for us, gave us new life, even while we were still sinners. This is the big difference between the reality of God's love and the way that God's love is often viewed in the world, including among many Lutherans. The world looks at God's love and God's salvation as an if-then proposition. If we repent, then God forgives us. If we change our behavior, then we are loved by God. If we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then we are saved. But salvation, according to Gerhard Ferdi, who is one of my favorite Lutheran theologians, isn't if then. Salvation and the love of God is because therefore. Because God loves us, therefore God sent his son. Because Jesus lived among us, therefore he understands our full humanness. Because Christ died and rose, therefore we have eternal life. This is grace pure and simple. God doesn't love us because we believe. We believe because God loves us. God doesn't love us because we repent. We repent because we experience God's amazing love. Paul writes again in our reading from our Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works. Nothing we have done or will ever do can earn God's saving love for us because God's love has already been given to us freely, not just in Christ's death, but in his incarnation, life, and most importantly, his resurrection. Amen.